heard a story on the radio the other day about a young lady whose name was Vanetta Flowers. You may have heard of Vanetta Flowers before. I had I had uh, didn't remember her name if I had heard it before. But Vanetta Flowers was a was a lady who, as a little girl, had grown up um, with a desire to compete in the Olympic Games. And so, from the time she was a little kid, she practiced and she trained and she ran and track and field was her thing. And at the age of 22, uh, she had the opportunity to to try out for the Olympics. And so she had two events, the, the 100 yard dash, or 100 meter dash, excuse me, 100 meter dash, and the long jump. Those were her two events. And so at the age of 22, she tried out, and in the Olympic uh, qualifying rounds, she, she, she almost made it, but by a fraction of a second, um, she was disqualified, didn't make it to the Olympics. What do you do when you spent your whole life up to age 22 training for this thing? Well, at 22, she decided, I'm not done yet. I'm going to give it one more shot. Four more years of, of getting up early and working out and eating the right things and exercise, doing everything that I can. And so for the next four years, she trained and trained and trained. Olympic qualifiers came around again. She competed in the long jump. And once again, at the age of 26, after pouring the last 17 years of her life, and to trying to qualify for the Olympic Games, the goal of her life, she failed again. What do you do now? Well, you can imagine she was disheartened and overwhelmed and a lack of identity. And where does my life go from now? She went back to, to life trying to figure things out. A couple weeks later, her husband comes home from the gym and he tells her, at the gym, I saw a sign that said, your Olympic dreams may not be over yet. She said, what are you talking about? He said, the sign said, if you're interested in trying out for the Olympic bobsled team, we need to hear from you. She had never heard of the bobsled, had no idea what it was, but the two qualifications to train for the Olympic bobsled team were that you had to be a good runner and you had to be good in the long jump. Well, fast forward two more years, and Vanetta Flowers became the first African-American lady to win a gold medal in the Olympic Games. How about that? How about that? First African-American lady to win a gold medal in the Olympic Games. Can you imagine 17 years plus two more of struggling and working and trying to figure out what's going on? 17 years. Some of y'all are saying, oh, I got a kid that's about that old. Y'all. <laughs> 17 years of not knowing what's going on. How many times in the middle of that do you think that she thought, man, why am I doing this? How can I be here? What's going on with this right now? Why, why am I in this place? And it reminds me of a verse of Scripture, very, very familiar verse of Scripture. It's not in your outline. I don't have it on the screen this evening, but it's Romans 8.28. And, and so many of us have heard Romans 8.28. It says, we know that in all things, uh, God works together for good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purposes. All things work together for good for a certain group of people. All things work together for good. What does that say to you right now? When you look at your life and you say, man, I'm in this season, Jeff. I've been in this place for a long time. I've been doing the right thing time after time. I've been working, struggling, sacrificing, doing everything, and it doesn't look like Anything is going to change. And if I'm honest with you, Jeff, it feels like what I thought was the purpose of my life, maybe I'm off base with that. Exactly where Vanetta Flowers was. Can I just tell you this evening that, that just because she didn't win and just because she didn't win again and just because she didn't make the team did not mean that God wasn't finished with her. He was working in her. And maybe you're in a place right now that the struggle that you've been going through for a long time is a struggle because God works in all things. And He doesn't work on your time, baby. Well, I'm sorry to tell somebody that tonight, but just because you're like, hey God, could you hurry this thing up a little bit? I mean, i got to get to the Golden Corral later tonight. He's not really concerned with your timeline. He's going to get you there when He gets you there. But you need to know that He's working all things. Who is He working all things for? For those who love Him. He's working all things together for good for those who love the Lord. Now let me just tell you this. Love is caring more about the other person than I care about myself. It's not just those who say, Woo! Yay God! Y'all know anybody's on Team God? Woo! Yay God! But you look at their life and you say, I thought they were, Woo! Yay God! 
But why are they here and there and doing that? Do they care more about God? Do they care more about His glory? Do they care more about carrying out His plan? Or do they just feel like, whoo, I'm on team yay God. Those who love the Lord and who are called according to His purpose. Those are the people that all things work out for. And if I were you right now, I would be asking this question. What if all things in my life are working together for the greater good for me if I love God? And I, you might say, well, Jeff, I do love God. But how do I know if I'm called according to His purpose? Now, that's a great question. How do I know if I'm called according to His purpose? What is His purpose? You might be asking that. Well, some old guys a long time ago were asking the same question, and in a, a document called the Westminster Shorter Catechism, look at how they answered that question. It says, man's chief end. In other words, the greatest thing for mankind to do is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. What's my purpose? To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. What does it mean to glorify God? How do I, how do I glorify something? Now, I like, the, I like the Carolina Panthers, and I've tried to glorify them, but them jokers let me down every stinking week. Come on, somebody. And I see some Redskins fans out there, so I know y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, we, we glorify things. We, we make a big deal out of them. We, we shine light on them. We lift them up. But, 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 but God, our chief end is to glorify God. Not our football team, not our job, not our bank account, not our kids. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Enjoy Him forever. Well, I learned this a few years ago and it made so much sense to me. that those two things are interconnected. When I glorify God, that's what He created me to do. To, to do things that, that show people the goodness of God. To live in a way that, that people see the, the power of God in my life. To say things, to do things, to be about things that bring glory to His name. Guess what happens when I do that? When I live in a way that glorifies God, I'm sending glory to Him, but it's not a one-way street. God returns joy into my life. I glorify Him. He brings joy into my life. And even though I may be going through challenging, difficult circumstances, the joy is still here even when life stinks. That's what God is trying to get us pointed forward to. And I love, I love, I love New Testament Jesus. Y'all may say New Testament Jesus. Y'all know Jesus is seen throughout the whole Bible, even in the Old Testament. But New Testament Jesus makes things so clear. Listen, y'all, I didn't grow up going to one of those fancy private schools. I am a public school somebody. Any public school folks here tonight? Yeah. So y'all understand, when I say that, that I like it, that Jesus puts things down on a rug where it's easy for me to get started climbing on it, he knew I was going to need some help understanding things. New Testament Jesus looks at the totality of the Scriptures and He knows that when God gave Moses those, those tablets and that became the Ten Commandments, He knows that that was just a portion of the 613 laws that God drew out and said to the nation of Israel, live by these laws. You want to make God proud, happy, good, be good with God? Then don't break any of these 613 laws. And if you do, you've got to kill an animal to make up for it. Ah! But New Testament Jesus said, Let, let's, let's, just, let's just dumb this thing down a little bit. Let's make it a little bit easier to understand. And I know that Jeff is going to want to know what his purpose is. And I plan Jeff with a purpose. I'm going to help him to get going so that he can step into his purpose. And at the end of his life, I want Jeff to be able to have fulfilled his purpose. Now, if you hadn't heard anything else I said tonight, you've got to hear that. God created you with the purpose. He has a plan for you to fulfill that purpose. And when you get on board with where He's taking you, He will get you to that place. How do we get there? Well, let's look at an encounter that Jesus had. It was recorded in, in Matthew. Look at Matthew chapter 22. Starting in verse 34, it says, Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. Now the Sadducees and Pharisees were two groups of religiously elite people. The Sadducees didn't believe in any, any resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees did. The Pharisees were, were elite, learned, scholarly Jews. So they would have memorized the first five books of what we call the Bible. They would have known all of the law of Moses, studied it for years. And they're arguing back and forth. And one of the Pharisees, an expert in the law, tested Jesus with this question. Now, man, pay attention to how that is set up. He's, he's an expert in the law, and he's trying to test Jesus. Can I just tell y'all something? He's 
He's going to test Jesus in Jesus' knowledge of the law. Do y'all remember that Jesus is the Word of God? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the living embodiment of the Word, and this man thinks he's going to test it. Anyway, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And that simply means that everything that has been set up until this point, God prophesied about a coming Messiah, God gave you the law, everything is contingent upon you loving God. And the love that you have for God fills you to overflowing so that you can love other people. You want to know what your purpose is? Love God. Let Him fill you back up so that you pour out and overflow onto other people. Huh. Sounds simple. What do I need to do? Well, a couple of things. Number one, pretty simple. Love God with everything. The song we sing sometimes is called How He Loved. And it says in that song, if grace were an ocean, we're all sinking. And what that means, man, is if we're in this ocean full of grace, the depths of God's grace. Let me see your eyeballs right now. Because if you're anything like me, maybe you've made some bad decisions this past week. Maybe if you can wind the clock back and say, ugh, shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have gone there. You need God's grace. You've done some things you shouldn't have done. I've done some things I shouldn't have done. But if His grace is an ocean, we're all sinking. In a good way. Because His grace has no, no end to the depths of it. Love God with everything. Love God with everything. You know why I do what I do? Like nobody made me be a preacher. Matter of fact, I ran from it as long as I could. The last thing in the world I wanted to do was to become a pastor and to preach. I thought that that meant that I was going to have to have a Cadillac about as long as this room and some snakeskin boots and some, you know, VO5 hair to go with it. I thought that's what I was going to have to do if I was going to be a preacher. And then I realized, man, that God filled me up with this thing of grace and I'll never get over the grace of God that forgives me for the junk that I've done, has forgiven me. And so God tells me to love Him with everything that I have. A few minutes ago I said to you that love is caring more about the other person than you do about yourself. Best way I know to describe that kind of love, and it's just a human love, it's not a perfect love like God's love for us. But I had, a, had an uncle. Actually, he was my great uncle. He was my mom's uncle. Uncle Dean and Aunt Lori. Everybody ought to have an Uncle Dean and Aunt Lori. Cute little couple, man. I've told you all about them before. Uncle Dean owned a, owned a uh, little, little store. And he, had a, had a, uh, he was a butcher. Had a butcher shop in there. A little convenience store and all of this stuff. And they had one daughter. Her name was Avis. And they poured all of their love onto that one daughter. And he poured all of his love into Lori. And she loved him. And they were just that couple. That family. Beautiful family. Well... The unfortunate thing about living in a broken world is that when we get older, sometimes bad things happen to good people. I don't know if you've noticed that yet or not. It's not because people are good or bad or anything like that. We saw that last week in the, in the message. But my Aunt Lori developed this nasty thing called Alzheimer's. Y'all heard of that? Oh, God. Sweetest little lady in the whole wide world. It's about that tall, hair about that big. I mean, it was fantastic. And she was sweet as she could be, and everybody loved her, and everybody loved Uncle Dean. But that Alzheimer's got a hold of her, man. And the sweetest little lady you've ever seen in your whole life became the meanest person to him. Not her fault. It was disease. It wasn't her. But, but every day of his life, while she was still alive, he would go and spend the day with her. And sometimes as that disease progressed, she wouldn't know his name. And as the disease continued to progress, he might walk in the room and a lady who never said a, a four-letter word or all her life probably would cuss him out. What did he do? He loved who she was, not what she was doing to him. 
She lo he loved her with everything that he had. And he visited with her every day of her life. That's caring more about the other person. I know when I go into this room that I'm going to have violence coming at me. I know that it's going to take my whole day. I'm going to put everything on hold. God says, love God with everything you have. That's what it looks like. And when you have been so affected by what God's done, you will be anxious and excited about the opportunity to do that. And then Jesus also says there's a second thing that we need to do, and that's loving God's people. Loving God's people. Jesus said, love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. This is the second commandment, and, and all the law and all the prophets hang on it. And then the, the guy, if you continue reading that story, the guy asks him another question, who is my neighbor? And Jesus launches into another story. He tells a parable about a man we now know as the Good Samaritan. We still use that euphemism in our age today. And the Good Samaritan is a picture of a man who, who was on a journey. And the two religious men saw a man who had beaten almost to death. And they walked on by. They didn't have time for it. But this Samaritan who was seen as an outcast, which simply meant that, that in that culture, they would have called a Samaritan a half-breed. Terrible term. But it was, he was half Jew, half Gentile, and the Jewish people would have looked at him with disdain. Gentile people would say, no, he's not part of us. But that good Samaritan saw a man who was hurting, who was dying, and he went to him, and he bandaged his, his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He took him to an inn. He paid the innkeeper for him to stay there. He gave him some money. He said, this is not enough. I'll be back tomorrow and I'll pay you more what I owe you. That's who your neighbor is. Jesus says, if you want to know what your purpose is, quit worrying, trying to figure out if you're supposed to be a teacher, a doctor, a lawyer, or a minister. Love God. See where people are hurting. Step into that. That's what He's looking for us to do. God loves people. Which people? Well, I hate to tell you this, but it's all people. <laughs> and so Jesus didn't stop there. He gave us one more passage. And it's called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. And the Great Commission, I love this passage of Scripture because as Jesus began to close out His time on earth, um, He knew that, that He was getting ready to leave. And so, so Jesus had left heaven, come into this world as a baby and a manger, and, and the baby grew up to be a boy, and the boy grew up to be a man, and the man went to a cross. And the purpose for Him coming here, the purpose, the purpose for Jesus coming into this world is because He saw us. He saw our sin. He saw our struggle. He saw our separation from the Father. And with eyes of compassion, He said, if the only way to purchase their freedom, to buy back the sins that they have committed, is for me to pour out my blood, then I'll do that. I'll go there and I'll go to that cross. Why His blood? Daddy was the Holy Spirit. Mother was the Virgin Mary. No sin. Never committed a sin in His life. His blood. The only blood in all humanity that was not tainted by sin. He was our only hope. He is our only hope. And He went to that cross and He willingly gave His blood, gave His life, poured it out so that we could accept Him and accept salvation and forgiveness. After He did that, y'all know the story? The story of Easter. He was resurrected and they saw Him. And, and, and the people saw Him over the next 40 days. Hundreds of people saw Him over the next 40 days. And he's, He spent that next 40 days and He's getting ready to ascend back to the Father. And so the bodily form of Jesus is not going to be with us anymore. And before He gets ready to leave, He says, get all of my followers together and meet me at the mountain. And so, look at Matthew 28, starting at verse 16. It says, then the eleven disciples. Jeff, I thought there were twelve. There were twelve. But after, after, after uh, uh, Judas betrayed him, he went out and hanged himself. So now there's only eleven. By the way, stop. Let's chase a rabbit just a minute. You know what the difference is between Judas who betrayed Jesus and went out and took his own life out of grief? You know what the difference is in him and Peter? Peter didn't give up. And Peter kept coming back. And Peter betrayed Jesus just as badly as Judas did. But Judas went and took his own life. Peter did not take his own life. He didn't know what was going on. He kept walking. And eventually, you know what God did for him? Even though he was the main betrayer of Jesus in that season, God made Peter the leader of this brand new church. 
If you're struggling with something today, I want to say to you, just because it looks like it's terrible, don't give up. Man, this thing, we read these stories. I, I guess I'm, I'm speaking out of a little bit of a brokenness now because you see these stories of pastors. Recently, a pastor just took his own life. And we see how people are hurting everywhere. Maybe God wants to say something to somebody here tonight. If you're struggling with that, don't give up. He can take what you're in right now and turn it into something you never expected. I don't know where that came from. don't know who that's for tonight. But anyway... It says, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Look at this. It says, that, remember, these are the people who had been walking with Jesus for three years. When they saw Him, they worshipped Him, but some doubted. You mean they walked with Jesus for three years, saw Him do all the miracles, and they doubted Him then. And they saw Him go to the cross, and they still doubted Him. They saw Him in His resurrected body, and still some of them doubted if you're sitting there right now thinking, man, I've struggled to place all of my faith in Christ. They did too. The people who saw Him physically. But man, when the Holy Spirit came and that thing blew in and changed everything, they saw everything that changed and they went all in. Some doubt it says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He gives them a list of what He wants them to do. Therefore, go, make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always. In other words, I'm not sending you to do this on your own. I'm going to be with you always, even to the very end. I'm giving you a purpose. I'm giving you a mission. I'm commissioning you to do four things. What are the four things? What do I need to do? Well, number one is I have to go to them. I have to go to them. Y'all... Growing up in a little Baptist church, in the little world I grew up in, we had this thing called Sunday night church. Any of y'all used to go to Sunday night church? Uh-huh. Well, the bad thing about Sunday night church is once in a while, about once a year, those missionaries that your church sponsored, they would come in and they had this round thing, a carousel thing, and they would set up the screen and they would do a little a slideshow thing and those missionaries, the ones that came to our church, they were in the Philippines and they would show pictures of the jungle and, and all these remote places and, and the Philippines is a very, very very advanced place now, but you see the missionaries come in, and they're going to show you pictures of the huts and the villages, and as a little kid, I'm sitting there thinking, Lord Jesus, I love you, and I don't want to go to hell, but please don't make me have to go to that place. I don't want to live in a hut. I don't want to live there. It's scaring me to death. And I grew up thinking that to be a good follower of Jesus, if I'm going to make Jesus happy, i got to go to those places. Somebody explained to me one day that in that original language, Basically what Jesus was saying when he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. Jesus, yes, there is a call to go to faraway places, but what he was basically was saying is, as you go, make disciples. Can I just tell you all that changes things? As you go, look for people who are obviously hurting. Some of y'all have stood on the coffee aisle at the Walmart. I know who my Walmart people are. You stood on the coffee aisle in the Walmart and you had conversations with your girlfriend who, who, who you haven't seen in years and she's telling you about how terrible her marriage is right now and you're thinking, what should I say? Jesus says, go as you're going. As you're going. Some of you guys have friends who, who, who you might be out out playing golf or hunting or whatever and your, guy start, your friend starts telling you how terrible things are. As you are going. As you're going. There are people you work with. There are people your kids play soccer with. There are places that you go where people need Jesus. As you go. Now does that mean we don't go other places? No. Brownie's in here tonight, man. She takes that van. She and Ashley and a bunch of other people take that van and they go into the, into the inner parts of Danville. We've got a young man who, who went out from our church this summer went to Boston. And we need to do those things. But for you, right now, today, what am I supposed to do? What's my purpose? Go. We have a responsibility to go. That's the first thing. The second thing he says is I have to make disciples. Well, go make disciples. Simple word. Uh, a disciple is simply someone who's following someone else. So Jesus was called the rabbi. He's the teacher. He knew the way that he wanted to teach people. What did Jesus want to teach people? We're now in this season of grace. 
God purchased our sin for us. We don't have to live by the law. We've got grace. And so Jesus has purchased that for us. We've got this grace. Now go and tell other people that, that the way that we're supposed to live, live holy lives, live lives that are separate, that, that are not like the world, and live lives that love God and love other people. How do I make disciples? Man, you don't have to go to seminary for this. You just read your Bible and see how Jesus operated when He came in touch with a... when He came in, in, into a into a, an encounter with a woman who had been caught red-handed in an adulterous affair, what did Jesus do? He rescued her and He sent her on His way and He forgave her. When Jesus met a man who was blind, He gave him sight back. What did Jesus do? He loved people and His connection with God helped Him to help people. That's how we make disciples. Third thing He says, He says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all say, wait a minute, I'm supposed to baptize people? Yes, you have got to leave here and go to go to uh, the farmer's thing down there by, what is that, Ollie's, and get one of those metal uh, horse troughs and take it to your house and baptize people at your house. No, you do not have to do that. You say, Jeff, you are the professional Christian. You're the one who's supposed to baptize people. Yeah, but let me ask you a question. When do we baptize people? Baptism is an outward sign of an inward change. And if, if people are going to be baptized, he's telling us to baptize people, he's telling us that we've got to go to people and share the good news and help people to receive the grace of God. Help people to, to accept Jesus and baptize them in the name of the Holy uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question right now? How are you doing? If Jesus says... That your commission, God Himself said, followers of me, go make disciples, baptize them. Would you say to me right now if we were sitting across the table, if I said, how are you doing it and making disciples, doing what Jesus told you to do? Or do you know how to lead someone into a relationship with Christ? If you don't, it's okay to be there, just don't stay there. If you don't know how to do that, I would really encourage you to connect with a mentor who can help you to understand your own salvation and to be able to lead someone else in a relationship with God. You know, every one of us is in one of four places. We're either lost, we're saved, we're a disciple, or a disciple maker. If you're not leading people to Jesus and making disciples, simply put, you're not carrying out the mission that God has for you. The last thing that I'll point out to you is I have to teach them. I have to teach them. Again, you don't have to go to seminary. He says, he says go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey all these things that I've commanded you. What did Jesus command us? To love people. Just simply love people. Love God. Love people. You know, you don't have to be in a, a small group leader or a Sunday school class leader. Moms, dads, you can teach your children how to love Jesus. Kids, you can teach your friends what it looks like. Every one of us has a responsibility to do these things. You know, man, you have people in your life that, 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 that they're struggling with things. Kids are driving them crazy. More month than there is money. Addiction is taking over their life. What would it look like for you to step into that situation and say to them, God has a plan? Every time one of your coworkers or friends or neighbors divulges to you and I'm struggling in my life, that is an opportunity for you to connect the dot in the purpose and the plan that God created you for. If you're so absorbed in all of the things that you're doing in your life, work and kids and all of the other stuff, and you're making zero progress in doing what God has called us to do, can I just tell you something? I'm not here to put to put guilt on you. Let me show you one last quote before we close up. Look at this quote from John Piper. It says, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. You know when I'm most satisfied in God? When He's given me an opportunity to dive into the connection with Him. And that connection with Him, He just fills me up with Him. And I have an opportunity when somebody sitting in front of me, whether it's through tears or whether it's through anger or whether it's through rabbit feet that's trying to run away, and I can say, hey, God still loves you. He's got a plan. 
If you'll trust Jesus, He'll make things better. And I see Jesus making things better in a lot of life. And that satisfies me in my soul because I'm glorifying God. And he's returning joy to me. What's the purpose for your life? Love God. Love people. What's the purpose for your life? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all these things I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is where we begin to land the plane. It's where we begin to close. But I want to ask you a question tonight. As we begin to close, Nate's playing behind me. It hit me earlier this week. Jesus said on that day, on that day, many people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do all these good things in your name? And Jesus said on that day, I'll say to them, away from me, I never knew you. The question I have for you tonight, in terms of purpose, you can't step into the purpose that God has for your life if you don't intimately know Jesus. In other words, if Jesus walked through those doors and started coming around the room, we would all collectively go, it's Jesus, He's here. And He'd start walking through and the people He knows, He would give high fives to, fist bumps to. What would He do when He came by you? In other words, do you know you've been saved? Do you know that you've given your heart to Jesus? Do you know that, that, that He's given you a new heart? Listen now. <laughs> I don't know how else to tell you this. Like, like if you've got yourself convinced, but when you look at your life and nothing has changed, have you really given your life to Christ? Because every person I see in the New Testament, every person that, 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 that has a story about God doing something in their life, they had an encounter with Jesus. They placed their faith in Him and they walked away changed that change taking place in your life? Or are you betting all of eternity on thinking, I said a prayer? I don't want to go to hell. I got baptized one time. But has your life changed? Do you intimately know Jesus? Are you following Him? Are you pursuing the purpose that He has for you? Jesus knows His followers. But He says, my sheep know the sound of my voice. So my question to you tonight is, where are you? I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes right there where you're sitting. You know, this is a very holy moment right now. It's a very serious moment. Some of you may have spent your entire life up to this point convincing yourself that I've always been a Christian. I've always been saved. I've always been a believer. believer. Is that true? Because I don't see that in the Bible. What I see in the Bible is every person had to come to a point where confronted with their own sin and their separation with God, every person has to make a decision. Am I going to follow Jesus? Do you know that you've made that decision? Are you walking with Him? If you're not, I'm going to say it this way tonight. It's okay, but it's not okay to stay there. It's really not okay because staying away means that you're missing out on the joy that He wants to pour into your life. You're missing out on the purpose that He created you for. And you are going a million miles an hour on a highway to hell. There's no other way to say it, church. You are on that highway to hell unless you have a relationship with Jesus. And that's not His plan for you. He loves you. He came into this world and to the cross for you. And He's saying to you tonight, if you hear the sound of my voice, you know that we're not on the same page. You know you've never given your life to me. What he's asking you right now is in this moment where you go all in and trust Jesus with everything. Here's what I'm asking you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And I want you to understand what I'm asking you to raise your hand to. If you've been saved before, if you know you're a follower of Jesus, this isn't for you. But if you know right now that the, the Holy Spirit of God is wrecking you, he's doing something in your spirit, and you know that there's no peace in you because you're not there. And 
God's saying to you today, today is your day of salvation. And you want that, and you don't want to spend one more anxious night. Jesus, I want you. I give you my life. If that's you right now, right where you sit, will you just raise your hand in the air? Jesus, I want you. Hallelujah. I see you there in the back. Jesus, I want you. I want to know that I'm saved. I want your purpose for my life. Anybody else? I saw one hand. Praise God for that. Anybody else that would say, man, I thought I was saved. I, don't, I really don't know. Like, I'm a pretty good religious person. But this thing of walking with Jesus, I'm not really sure. I want to know that my future is secure in Jesus. Before we close, anybody else? Jesus, I want you. Don't miss me tonight. Jesus, I want to give you my life. Anybody else? Hallelujah. If you're sitting there right now, you want to know how it is that you can enter into a relationship with, with God. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. And coming through, through Jesus means that you're giving your life to Him. You're accepting the new life that He has for you. You can just pray this prayer. Anybody in this room, whether you raise your hand or didn't, you don't have to pray it out loud. Just from your heart to God. God, I give you my life. I want you to save me. Jesus, you are the only option. I believe in you, Jesus. I'm placing all of my faith and all of my trust in who you are and what you did at the cross. I give you my life. Forgive me for my sin. Make me new. I will follow you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.